How did the ancient Israelites tell time? What I mean by that is if we were to go in a time machine and ask the Israelites, hey, what time is it? Would they use hours? Would they use minutes? Would they use seconds? How did the Israelites tell time? We asked this question in a course at biblicalculture.org called Daily Life in Biblical Israel. And what we found is that the Bible, specifically the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, the Old Testament, is much more general about time than we are today, but in certain respects it's also more specific. So let's take a look. Beginning in the morning, it says in the book of Exodus, And the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh is stubborn. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning, Baboker, as he is coming out to the water. And what we see here is, is that Moses is told to go to Pharaoh in the morning, just a general idea, not anything more specific. It's just a general concept, go to him in the morning. In the book of Joshua, we have a verse that is a little more specific, and it says, On the seventh day they rose early at the rise of dawn, ka'alot hashachar, and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. So these soldiers who are about to conquer the city of Jericho are rising so early it's even before dawn itself. And that's about as specific as we get for the morning period. Moving on to midday, we see in the book of Genesis that Joseph says to his servant, bring the men into the house and slaughter an animal and make ready, for the men are to dine with me at noon, Bitzahorayim, at midday. So that's a general time, just midday, noon time. So we're now at the midpoint of the day, the sun has risen to the top of its arc, and then what comes next in the Israelite mindset is the heat of the day. As we read in Genesis, the Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day, Kechom Hayom. So the heat of the day is probably when the sun is at its full strength, which is probably midday and just after it, before it begins to set. And we have a similar term in the book of Samuel, where Saul tells the people of Yavesh Gilad, Tomorrow, by the time the sun is hot, Bechol Mashemesh, you shall have deliverance. What comes after midday and the afternoon is night. So let's move on to verses that talk about the setting of night. At the end of the book of Judges, we are told, Then, at sunset, Be'erev, there was an old man coming from his work in the field. Now the Hebrew term Erev, which means sunset, can also mean the general evening time, but that was the time when you would be done work. It would be the time you would come in from the field or you would find shelter for the night. We have a similar scenario in the book of Genesis, which says, When Jacob came from the field at sunset, but Erev, Leah went out to meet him and said, You must come in to me, for I have hired you with my son's mandrakes. So he lay with her that night. Balilah. This verse begins with the beginning of the evening, Erev, and it ends with the actual night itself, the Lila. So the Erev begins the evening, and Lila is the night itself, when there's no light whatsoever. Now we can get a little more specific. For example, in the book of Exodus we read, Moses says, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I will go out through Egypt. Every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. So this is about the parallel of what we saw in midday, at Sohorayim being midday, here we have Chatzot Talayla being midnight. And the night was a time for sleep, a time for dreams, a time for even visions, but it was also divided into watches. And what that means is that let's say you were traveling with a friend, and the two of you were on the road sleeping in the middle of the night. You wouldn't want to be robbed. So what you would do is, for the first part of the night, you're both up, you're eating, you're, you're talking to each other, life is good, but then one of you falls asleep. So one person is going to take a watch, and then the next person will take a watch, and then there will be one third watch until the morning comes. So there are three watches in the night, and we can see this in places such as Lamentations, which says, Arise, cry out in the night, at the beginning of the watches. Lerosh Ashmarot. For the second watch, we can turn to the book of Judges, which says, So Gideon and the hundred who were with him came to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch. Ha'ashmoret ha'tichona. And we can find the last watch mentioned in the book of Exodus. At the morning watch, ba'ashmoret ha'boker. The Lord in the pillar of fire and cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. So we're starting to get a feel of how the ancient Israelites kept time. It was much more general than we do, and it was also a lot more descriptive, tied to the day's events itself. So instead of saying 2 p.m., they would actually say, oh, it's the heat of the day. 
Instead of saying 2 a.m., they'd say, oh, that's the second watch, and so on and so forth. And you'd have more general terms too, just like the morning or the evening. These are certain times. But when did hours and minutes and seconds come into the understanding of the people of the land? We can actually see that at the close of the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, and the opening of the new text, the Josephus, the New Testament, the mission of the rabbis, we see hours come in quite clear. For example, let's take a look at the following statement by Josephus, the first century historian. When he's describing a battle, he says, for the fight had lasted from the ninth hour of the night till the seventh hour of the day. This is counting time the way the Romans counted time, the way the Greeks counted time, and you can even say the way the ancient Egyptians counted time. That is, is that the entire night is divided into 12 equal units, and the entire day is divided into 12 equal units. And so the amount of each unit can change during the seasons. During the winter, the daylight hours are going to be much smaller, and during the summer, the daylight hours are going to be much larger but you're still going to have 12 hours in every single day and 12 hours in every single night. And that's what we see here in Josephus. This numerical concept of time can also be seen in a parable in the book of Matthew where many different workers are hired at many different times. So for example, we read, in the third hour, in the sixth hour, in the ninth hour, and even in the eleventh hour. So what we see here is that the day isn't described as the heat of the day, of midday, or anything like that. What we see is that it's described by different hours. And moving on to Jewish texts, we can find in the very opening of the Mishnah from about the year 200, the following statement of Rabbi Yehoshua. One may recite Shema until three hours of the day, for such is the way of the sons of kings to arise at the third hour. Here in the rabbinic text, we're starting to see hours, the third hour. And once again, that would have been the Greco-Roman hour of the daytime being divided into 12 equal periods and the nighttime being divided into 12 equal periods. So where does this leave us? In some ways, the ancient Israelites were much less specific about time than we are. They never had to make the 10-15 train. They never had to worry about a 27-minute timer for a recipe. But also, in a certain sense, the Israelite way of time is much more descriptive than ours. Our way of time is just arbitrary numbers. It's 7.15, it's 6 o'clock, it's 2 feet, it's 2 a.m. You know, these kind of numbers don't really have meaning. But for the Israelite, it was kechom hayom, as the sun's heat is moving in the day. It was ka'alot hashachar, as the dawn is breaking. It was katsot halayla, the middle of the nighttime. It was the second watch. It was the first watch. All of these had much more kind of real meaning in the daily life than our 1, 2, 3 p.m. do. So that's it. If we would go to an ancient Israelite and we would ask them, what time is it? They would give us something very different than our own answer. It would be something like, oh, it's the heat of the day or the day is dwindling away. If you enjoy this type of study and would like to continue and take it further or deeper and also interact with me or other great professors, come take a class at biblicalculture.org. At biblicalculture.org, we have classes on biblical texts, on biblical context, on languages, on archeology, span on history, on geography, you name it. If you wanna study it, come take a class with us at biblicalculture.org. Special thanks to bibleplaces.com for allowing us to use their amazing photographs you should definitely check out their website, BiblePlaces.com. And I look forward to seeing you for our next video.